state of emergency. There are hundreds and hundreds of bodies lining the streets. I haven't actually figured out how to fire the gun yet. Report <laughs> from the World Health Organization showed that the latest vaccination tests have failed. With the bureaucrats out of power, we can finally take the necessary steps. No, you haven't given enough instructions, I'm afraid. ...to be placed under martial law. All residents are required to report to their designated quarantine. Riots have continued for a third consecutive day, and winter rations are at an all-time low. A group calling themselves the Fireflies have claimed responsibility for both attacks. Their public charter calls for the... Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Benjamin Thompson from the Microbiology Society here in the UK. Uh, I'm joined at the Wellcome Trust by a group of experts. We're going to take a look at The Last of Us and maybe dip a bit into the science behind it and a bit of the sort of sociology behind it as well. How accurate do you think this particular scenario was? So we've, we've learned in the first 15 minutes of this game that everything has gone very bad, very, very fast. Okay. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how maybe accurate this representation is of, of what would happen in a terrible situation like that? One thing I think they capture quite powerfully is, is the way that order in society is quite fragile. And it's something that struck me particularly uh, it would have been uh, five years ago, almost to the day when we had the, the, the riots in London. It's a, the fact that it turned out there are only a, a few thousand police. You know, you've got, got several million people in, in London. Uh, and it turned out when it, when it pushed came to shove, they were able to get less than 10,000 police on the streets. And you realise that the number of police to, to number of actual people in, in the society is so small that, that if everybody decides to go on, on, on at the same time and, and create problems or, or order breaks down, then... Things can go out of, of control you know, within, within minutes, within hours, and it's quite difficult to get that control mm. back again. I mean, um, why, why is it then do you think that, that game makers love the post-apocalyptic world? Oh, well, there are many reasons. I mean, the, the biggest is probably that there aren't so many people around in the post-apocalypse. Uh, it also, there are many things that are important to a video game that aren't necessarily linked to the narrative that work with the post-apocalypse, so you can control resources, for example. It lets you have familiar landmarks, present them in a new way, destroyed, overgrown, whatever. Um, obviously, uh, when we're talking about the opening, there's a lot there that is uh, unrealistic. I, I will bow to the experts. Uh, I think what's, um, what's important about the way The Last of Us is presenting it is it's trying to um, give a very personal, ground-level view of how an unfolding pandemic might work. Were something ever to happen, let's say, t today or tomorrow, I mean, goodness me, uh, how would it play out, do you think? What, what would be the first, the first reaction of the emergency services or the government? What do we think we would do? What, with a pandemic like this? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> let's, let's say a pandemic like this. Why not? Let's go for it. Let's, let's go 10 out of 10 on an awfulness rating straight away. Well, I don't know about This is 11, so not 10. Really? OK, all right. 11 out of 10, then, in that case. <laughs> What's the first thing we'd see, do you think, from, a, from, a, from an infrastructure perspective? Um, first thing you do is you, you bring together the, the Cabinet COBRA Committee, that's the Cabinet Emergency Committee. I'm assuming there must be some kind of protocols for it. We have some things in, in place so that part of a, a project I'm involved in at UCL, um, together with Public Health England and various other universities, is to create a pandemic early warning system, effectively to, to do things so that, so that this never happens, so that you have a combination of observing what's happening on Twitter, Facebook, things that are openly available. You're putting together uh, things like... Uh, receipts from, for, from pharmacies, see, seeing whether there's a, there's a rise in people looking for certain sorts of meds and putting that information with, with doctor's appointments to work out, well, well, do we need to start vaccinating more people to, so that you can create a, a dashboard where you can see where, where the disease is, is moving, where you need to put resources. So a lot of the game is about ensuring that it doesn't get out of control. The UK does have a, a pandemic strategy for things like influenza and for um, other sort of infectious diseases and obviously they have various threat levels and um, so I think a lot of it is about sort of planning as well because uh, as well as people being sick you're also going to have people off work and there's going to be that impact on kind of the workforce and the delivery so it really there's a lot of work sort of being done to try and ensure like a whole systems approach. What would happen in the first instance? Personally for me I would be locking the doors, I would be closing the blinds, I would be putting heavy objects in front of the doors and not going out. Trying to look at the television, obviously the television's gone out there what, what do we know about the sort of any research that's been done on, on what people tend to do? And what do you think you would do if something like this happened? I mean, panic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that seems, seems like the point one would be <laughs> freak out. I'm yeah, not. I, I'm not really the man you want in charge. Um, I think, uh, you know, 
let's say rather than turning people into raging zombies, we were dealing with a pandemic that was very, very contagious, mm. uh, something like that, you would want to avoid other people. It seems to me quite unnatural in that situation. You'd want to be in the middle of a crowd. But you're the same as me. You're staying in. You're maybe a single more or less yeah i'm single I'm, I'm bead of sweat in the I'm, head i'm trying to avoid large crowds yeah and we'll see how long i last okay <laughs> and what about yourself what do you think stay in yeah stay in i would definitely be staying in. yeah yeah and me too <laughs> <laughs> maybe curfews and and isolating people from from others to prevent them getting sick now is this a, an effective way of of keeping populations safe and it's kind of the opposite of uh maybe a TB hospital, it's the other way around. We're trying to keep the, the healthy people in and the sick people out rather than the sick people in and the healthy people out. So, I mean, looking maybe from a historical perspective, is this an effective way of preventing disease? Certainly in terms of, um, like, throughout history, there's been lots of isolation, you know, right back to the 1600s when ships would come to Europe bringing cargo, they would have to go through health authorities and be checked for plague and for other infectious diseases and you know even right through to kind of you know the Ebola outbreak in the last few years isolating infected people um, you know is a way of, of managing a situation like that so you know there's certainly room for elements of that in kind of the management of situations like this by the way that the most amazing diagnostic test i ever I seen know, it's the, it's the in a few now. seconds <laughs> wow so this was in 2013 i think is that no. right well that's 2033 2033 okay. the start of the game is 2013 and then it skips 20 years i want so to be inventing that one really okay well, <laughs> yeah yeah let's get on, let's get on that right now hey. the, the fact that it's a fungus yes does shock me because actually up to now, I only know of fungus uh, ca causing disease or causing serious disease and death only with people with with a problem with the immune system. Mm. So, uh, um, yeah, a fragile or, or non-existent immune system. So, in the case of a pandemic that has gone so quickly with a fungus, yeah, it's yeah. It's, an, it's for me it's a strange choice of disease. Although the effect of it is is a very common effect, I assume. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a rabies scenario. Mm. Uh, the, the, the zombie everything. It's always based on rabies. People yeah. get <laughs> mad and they want to bite the others and then they spread the infection. Classic. Well, let's throw that over then from the, from the maybe with, with your sort of a game journalist hat and, and you knowing game makers, why have they chosen this one, do you think? You know, their their primary consideration here is not whether spores are a realistic vector uh, for spreading. It's whether spores are an interesting visual effect that can make an interesting gameplay section, mm. such as wearing your gas mask and moving slowly through somewhere dark. And then when you see the enemies themselves, they obviously have this striking uh, weirdness of being human, but clearly yeah. not yeah. human. What do we do about stuff that we don't know about? How do we keep an eye on this? You mentioned surveillance a few times there. How, how, are we, how do we look for new stuff? Where are we looking for it? That was exactly the case as Ebola. The, the research was done in the early 2000s. There was uh, a vaccine uh, prickly uh, candidates made, and that's why it went so fast when when it when when it came out. Mm -hmm. And the vaccine could then be progressed very quickly to to a phase one and and a phase two and so on. So. The idea is then to, to, f to fund research on this list of disease so that we, we prepare as much as we can vaccines that are ready, not commercialized, but then could be used in that situation before it gets mm. out of control, let's say. Oh. So that's the preparedness plan. Okay, so, so be prepared then. Was it be prepared in, in terms of vac vaccines. We can't stop globalization, but how can we mitigate its effects, maybe? I think it's extremely difficult to, to mitigate the effects Effectively, I mean, one thing that's interesting to look back to is the 1918-1919 flu pandemic, which killed more people than the First World War. Even in that case, it turned out that it was carried on ships across the Atlantic, and you saw it within a, a few months spread, spreading ac across the world. And now we're so much more mobile. There's so many whether whether just whether sort of fruits, livestock, uh, but also people traveling mm. across. And I mean, you can you can have scanners at at airports or do various things to try and check whether people have elevated temperature and so on. I think it can reduce the risk, but it, it, the likelihood of, of catching every case and, you know, and if you have a sort of highly infectious mm -hmm. disease, then even if you know, a few cases get through, you, you can still start a, a, an epidemic and, and if, if the conditions are right, it, it can still get out of control. So it's, it's likely to give you a bit more time or to, or to or more sort of create a bottleneck, which will mean that you've got more time to get things sorted out. Mm. But the, I think the likelihood of, as it were, keeping our sort of our septid aisle pure from, from <laughs> infectious disease by scanning people who's coming through the borders, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a probably a UKIP fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. So we have Ellie, she has an arm bite. Could 
bearing in mind what we know about this world, so let's assume there's not a great mm. deal of science there, could we take a sample from, of tissue or something from her arm bite and use that to grow up a vaccine of some sort? Not a, not a chance. No? No. One thing that really struck me when I was researching this uh, a year or two ago is that um, if you ha really do have the, the, the massive pandemic and then it's question of well, how do we vaccinate everyone, it turns out that there's one of the bottlenecks is the actual global capacity to, to manufacture enough mm. vaccines. And that I think that it, it seemed that part of the problem was that, well, it seems a bit of a waste of money to have all these you know, vaccine factories you know, doing nothing all, all the time. And then to, to gear up and actually to make, uh, if sometimes you might need two doses of vaccine, to, to make enough vaccine to, you know, to, to vaccinate seven billion people. And it's, it's not something that the world can do at the drop of a hat. It's, 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 uh, how, how long would it take? takes a, a, a lot of time and especially because it's, uh, s several vaccines are made differently so you need dif dif different types of plans uh, or of conditions to, 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 to prepare the vaccine, to grow the vaccine. It depends if it's uh, uh, um, uh, an attenuated or a, a killed whole bug or whether it's a recombinant protein or, or the, th this is a totally different plant and a diff different approach. So normally uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a preclinical vaccine developer. I'm not working in private companies or, or pharma producing vaccine. But um, as much as I know, the, the, the plant is actually designed for the vaccine when the vaccine is, is, is coming through the, the, the pipeline. So plants are designed for specific vaccines very often. So, so let's say uh, the, the, the new pandemic needs a, a type of vaccines where there's maybe two plants in the whole world because there's two pharma companies producing it. You're entirely right. There's, there's no capacity at all to produce very quickly. Uh, one vaccine for seven billion people. We've got her now. She's infected, but she's not uh, showing developing the disease. Showing yeah, that's the disease. that's still interesting on the point of view of yeah. She's a case, she's a case study, if nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we take her yeah. to our our research uh, resource poor but appropriate for the for the period research center. Mm -hmm. How long would it take to develop something that y they could inject into me to prevent me getting infected with the fungus? So before you test your vaccine in a human, can take. In the best case scenario, I'd say two years, and uh, in the normal scenario, it's five, ten years. Ten years, five. potentially ten if years. It's, well, look at HIV, for example. Mm. How long are we? Twenty years? Yeah, twenty, thirty More? years probably, yeah. Thirty years, and, and we don't, well, we have things in clinical trials, but not, not a product. So it really depends on the complexity of the bug and the complexity of, of, of fighting it or, or finding mm. ways to fight it and how the bug reacts to, to, the, to the fight. Some bugs just mutate. You have an antibody that blocks it, and then uh, the next again. generation, yeah. it's, it's mutated. So that is a very big, big, big deal. So typically, we, we, we do say vaccine developer developers that if we're given a disease, yeah, it takes 10 years. It's... Ted, 10 years is an optimistic. I mean, do you think that maybe game makers should work more or work closer with scientists to ensure that at least there's a passing, uh, passing nod to, to, to what would really happen? I mean, in this case, you say in this case, maybe not, but w even if they just said, oh, this, this, you know, we're going to make this vaccine, it's going to take some time, but, you know, we're going to mm -hmm. do it, would, would at least a nod towards realism, do you think that, that would be I, I, Well, I, th I think even more than a nod. I mean, it very much depends on the type of game you're making again. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you are making a kind of brainless sci-fi shooter, nobody is really playing that with science. If you're making something, and I think The Last of Us does have ambitions to be a kind of uh, a deeper game with deeper themes. I mean, obviously the themes here are more emotional. They're about the father-daughter bond. Um, but they, it is it is a scenario where you can see uh, it could present some of the ethical questions around uh, vaccination and science. What are the chances of this? Like, I mean, uh, we've talked about <laughs> we've talked about infrastructure, we've talked about science, we've talked about vaccine development. Is is this game though purely science fiction? I know it's an open-ended one; it's a difficult one to answer, to say yes or no. But are there pieces of it we could take out and learn from? Or what do we think? Well, I'll hand over to the actual experts. The only thing I would say is that if there is a pandemic, the victims of it are more likely to be you know, dying rather than running at you. Mm, it, it does seem to be, <laughs> the, yeah, that would be the case, yeah. Well, anything's possible, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay. Who knows? All right. maybe, maybe that's, that's uh, yeah, too much of a hypothetical question. But um, well, listen, thank you all so much for, for joining me today. Um, thank you at home for joining us as well. Uh, I've been Benjamin Thompson. Uh, we've been here at the Wellcome Trust. See you again soon. Thanks a lot. So, is everything you were hoping for? got its ups and downs, but you can't deny the
you, though. 